do this like obligatory stuff like things like you know where you're born raised you know, a bit of earliest memories would be good to know mm -hmm. my background yeah. uh, so i was born in glasgow but it was the nearest hospital when i say nearest it wasn't that near uh it's <laughs> have you ever been to argyle at all do you know it at all no like the region of argyle that's uh so there's a town called gilphead which is where i technically even from but i was baby we moved away so my dad is a teacher uh, he taught maths uh, i didn't inherit those genes uh, or skills or whatever but uh yeah he taught maths and then gradually worked his way up mm. and uh so as he kind of became he was a deputy head teacher in Creef, if you know Creef at all, it's yeah, near Perth. Yeah, 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 I know. And then um, he became a head teacher, so we moved to Kerry Muir, which is quite near Dundee. Ah. Uh, so this was kind of where I came as a kid. It's interesting living here now because there's so much of Dundee I didn't know, despite living next to here for mm. 10, but 10, 11, 12 years. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm from. Not really from anywhere specific. So, so like the, the, the timeline, so like how long did you stay in Glasgow and how long did you stay in Crete? I mean, my whole family's from Glasgow. I did genealogy of it, actually, and I was wondering <laughs> kind of, because, you know, the Industrial Revolution, everyone moves to Glasgow, yeah, yeah. right? So you find out that it got some from Northern Ireland, some from Argyle, and some from, like, uh, everywhere. It turned out there was one line that was just Glasgow forever. <laughs> like, it was like, you get as early as it goes, it's still Glasgow. So, like, <laughs> family is a bit as Glasgow you get. Like, but my dad, uh, hey, his his father's side were from Lithuania, oh. um, and they moved to Glasgow, I think a hundred years ago now. But still, mm. kind of, um, I don't know, still means quite a lot, kind of, because my dad was growing up. There were a lot of kind of like family events, and his like you know uncles and aunties would, um, mm. kind of, they would talk Lithuanian with each other, and mm. uh, uh, so you know, so that's the kind of background there but they all moved to Glasgow because of mining so mm. mining. there's a street in Glasgow called Baltic Street which turns out where a lot of them lived um, so yeah that's kind of where they're from and then uh, mm. my mum's from near Glasgow as well so that's kind of I got a lot of family I did my university there I know Glasgow a lot better than I know Dundee despite I lived in Kerry Muir from the age of like I don't know late 90s kind of mm. mm. uh, to when I went to university so mm. it's, it, it's strange but Dundee's changed a lot over the years as well because when we came I was still talking about the mega bowl I, and apparently mega bowl's been yeah. gone like 10 years now <laughs> which is a shame because they're really good but there you go <laughs> going back to your like earliest memories like you your mom was working as well or she just like housewife uh, no she was originally a graphic designer uh, she oh. dropped it uh, to go with my dad and she became kind of she did a lot of different jobs uh and kind of uh, she worked in a shop in the girl pet when we were there and then became she's now a learning support assistant in schools so she does a lot of mm. things with kids who have special needs mm. uh, and you know i saw a lot of her so special needs is something kind of mm. uh, you know, being aware of the kind of things that people who, need, who have special needs in school and kind of the, the lack of investment they've had over the last 10 years as well and kind of seeing that mm. side of things as well. It's the kind of left an impression, yeah. But yeah, my mum uh, was working as well, yeah. So that's quite interesting because I mean, then your family moved to like Pittenween. Uh Near Pittenween, yeah. Yeah, uh, Creo, yeah. So is it like linked to it, her interest in art, design? I don't know. Um, she still does a bit of art and design. She's always has. I think I got more from her than I did with my dad when it comes to that, because mm. I quite like art myself. So, like, what do you think of this Sue Gray? Is it Sue Gray or what Gray? It's Sue Gray, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, I think, I mean, what she's a parent... I, if, if this was put on a podcast, uh, this would be one of those things like you're listening to in the past and you can hear everyone. Uh, I used to do a podcast years ago and on the morning of the referendum on the EU, like we took a guess on what would happen and both of us were wrong. So one <laughs> thought it would be 55-45. I said that we would remain by a, a, by a ball here. That was the word I used. Uh, like I thought it would be like a few thousand votes in it, but we still remain. 
But no, so I, both of us were wrong. So <laughs> honestly, we can't know. Apparently, it's heavily redacted because of the police report. So they'll submit this. But then there's apparently another one coming later on. Mm. But it's not really up to anyone other than the Tory party to sort them out. Like, if the report is going to damage their chances of re-election and he becomes damaged goods permanently, they'll get rid of them. Mm. And it's a kind of sad state of affairs is that the opposition can say what they want and the public can say what they want. But really, mm. the only thing that will shift them are his own MPs because they're scared of losing their jobs. And um, it's a kind of one of the strange things about having a kind of big majority is that there's a lot of people who won seats at the last election who are in the north of England. And I don't know, did you see the guy who defected across? Yeah, yeah. The, they pulled his constituency, and apparently, if he was a conservative at the next election, he'd get completely destroyed. But um, so we can't really know. There's too many variables, but I suspect that they'll get rid of them. Uh, would be my guess because I can't imagine them surviving breaking the law, and mm. the public really, you know, warming to him again. Um, it's not like America, I think. I think we're quite different. And it was Trump doing a lot of things like this. I still think, uh, I think there's some differences in how we elect people, but also kind of like, you kind know, of, the US has maybe stronger regional differences. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the kind of, low, their media is less centralized than ours is maybe. There's a lot of variables that mm -hmm. make me think that we can't really predict how it's going to go in any. Mm -hmm. Uh, accurate sense, but I think that if he's done for this, then he'll be gone. Do you think that, or are you just hoping? Or <laughs> to be sincere, like for me, like you know, if Sugre is honest, if the establishment is honest, then Boris Johnson is living basically today. So mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen uh, because what they did, I mean, they 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 made it more bureaucratic. So like that, that way the modern statecraft works now. So the, these are a bunch of managers, bureaucrats <laughs> running the show. There is no, you know, the political, you know, the way we saw like politics, like Nelson Mandela, or like, you know, <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. So those things are gone. Uh, we will not see that kind of things, no, the leadership, you know, like sticking to your, you know, the things you really believe in. There, mm -hmm. there are no beliefs here, you know. <laughs> So the Tories can do things which are quite anti-Tory, and you no, know, it, it's just all about you know you you were mentioning about uh, for for some this is just job you know it's a cushy job. Yeah, it's um, I suppose I, I like I, I I enjoy my Machiavelli. I'm reading just now as well for another project, but uh, it, I kind of always think back to this in that if you read about kind of the period he's in. The, the threat that you're really under is death, right? That the prince is written from a perspective that you could be killed. And uh, I have a little section of the discourse as they published separately called On Conspiracies. It was mm. kind of disappointing to find out it was just a section of another book I own, but it was quite nice to have this little section that's specifically about that bit. And mm. he's basically saying as well, if, uh, essentially, uh, better the devil you know insofar as if you get rid of someone, you don't know who's going to be the next one, right? But uh, also, uh, there's this, the real threat of death. And I suppose the one advantage is that they're not fearing for their lives, they're just fearing for their jobs. But uh, So there is an incentive for people to behave, otherwise we can get rid of them. But then mm. there's plenty of Tories who are in safe seats as well, who will be, doesn't matter what happens. Uh, I think a lot of them are in safer seats than Boris Johnson is, because mm. uh, there was talk about him losing his seat a couple of mm. elections ago, or last election or something. So. And it is kind of sad that people are kind of motivated primarily by that, but mm. no, uh, I suppose to some extent it's nice that there's a check on ideologues in office that they have to listen to the people, otherwise they might lose their job. But it, mm. again, that's dependent on what type of seat you're in. If you're in a safe seat, then you don't really mm. have to listen. Mm. It's... I, th I think like for me, this is a more historical problem. No? So if you look at UK's political history, I mean, Tories are the most successful political party. Mm -hmm. um, of 300 years. So, I mean, it's linked with the, how society is built on, you know, what kind of belief system over the years. Mm -hmm. So, it, it seems like lots of respect for the ruling class here. So, I think that the problems are much deeper than just like Tory or Boris Johnson.
yeah, well, the Tories as well have had a lot of reinventions and, I, you know, it, perhaps the nature of like British politics having two sort of larger parties uh, that are quite big tent, that is that you have a lot of different tendencies in it. And there seems to be a sort of still a tendency that you can sort of trace back a long time ago in terms of like the ruling class and kind of mm. appealing to, I mean, uh, I, I've got a cup here uh, that's like, I got as a gift. I like it because it stops at David Cameron and after it has a question mark, who's the next prime minister? It's just <laughs> like, you don't want to know. You don't want to know what happens after him. Oh. But like, uh, yeah, it's Alex Douglas Holm on this is pictured with a rifle hunting because he got skewered for that. He was seen to be too aristocratic. Um, and there's a kind of element to the party in that, that there's a sort of traditionalist element. Then there's the Thatcherite wing, which doesn't, you know, they've had mm -hmm. lots of fights. Edward Heath as well didn't really, obviously had a lot of fights for Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, at present, I remember in 2015, because we did the podcast on Machiavelli back then, and, um, and we were watching the rise of Trump in real time. And it's maybe one of the nice things about it, listening back, is you're going, oh yeah, I remember that. Or, but nobody thought he would be elected. But when he was, the thing I remember saying to the guy that was also doing it was, everyone's going to copy this. This is going to be how everyone does politics. Mm -hmm. And so there's, I don't know whether it's new or old. I'm sure anyone who studies populism will say it's old. But like, there does mm -hmm. seem to be a kind of more populist kind of national, kind of nationalist wing of the Conservative Party as well that is relatively new. And they don't really see eye to eye. It's, um, <laughs> it's just it's just interesting how they fill these vacuums i don't even think boris johnson fits really clearly into that nationalist thing because before before he tried to say he was quite liberal when he was mayor so he's kind of just shifting with the sands as well because i mean i think the tendency for like you no know, this idea about nationalism is a, such a powerful ideology you know it helps it helps if you're corrupt because you know then you have to start up things so that people kind of like really behind you. And historically that happened. No? So, uh, so populism, nationalism, these are kind of part and parcel and feed each other. But at the end, all roads lead to Rome, which is basically the you know, elite will be in power. Yeah, well, I, what's interesting is that in the, my grandparents' generation um, in Glasgow, the conservatives used to get votes. And for a long time, it wouldn't, but like, that was religiously based and sort of on the union and things. And as recent, I remember when I was an undergrad, they showed you how it broke down on the Scottish elections, that there was still a religious, within Glasgow, a religious kind of element that people who are uh, Catholic were more likely to vote Labour in Glasgow. Uh, and that's broken down somewhat, but what's interesting is kind of the nationalism kind of right wing, kind of culturally right wing element, the conservatives and kind of come back in because, mm. but then he was always there, you know, Norman Tebbit was always a person in the government in Thatcher and my, I seem to remember Michael Howard, although I was pretty young back then, mm. I seem to remember him being kind of more socially kind of mm. on the right uh, when it came to prisons and so on. So mm. Mm. And I'm not really into kind of categorizing these things because you can always think of kind of quite clear cleavages in British political history, but mm. it's the development of the House of Commons over a long time and uh, kind of this problem of safe seats um, is a kind of a kind of echo of like previous parliaments mm. um, and how it evolved gradually over time. You look at other countries in Europe that had these mm. sort of sudden breaks. And mm. Sometimes you think. Uh, Sometimes a crisis is worth it. <laughs> Maybe a good idea from time to time to. And, but the thing is, of course, I'm saying this. Um, you know, we had a large break in our constitution in 1910 because of the House of Lords voting down the budget over, you know, uh, the welfare state and land taxes and so on. So, and that was a huge change. So, I don't think it's really the case that we didn't really evolve. We evolved very slowly because it's a very easy narrative to put forward. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I was surprised that Brexit didn't shake up things more. Um, that people throughout the whole thing sat quite happily in their houses. Uh, you know, mm. with inflation now, you've got inflation, you've got energy prices, uh, and the government will rattle off things like low unemployment. But mm. I think I think at the end of the day, people know whether when the economy is working or not, right? 
uh, that you can quote all sorts of statistics out of about how, oh yeah, there's, you know, people are in employment and so on, but people know, and, and I feel like just now it's quite, and for the last few years, it's been quite evident that the economy has not been healthy, that they've been, you know, you just experience of it sometimes quite useful. Mm. And I'm surprised that still, like uh, the Sue Gray report and people's uproar about that, people are quite, I don't know, there's not been any large protest. There have been protests, but, you know, mm. there's not been any particular colossal shifts as much as you might expect if you told someone in advance of something, yeah, this will cause chaos, you know. Because uh, I remember when Brexit came out, they were preparing for, you know, all sorts of things with the police and so on. I remember reports of that. None of it really came mm. in. But also, it was such a fractured situation. Boris Johnson's deal wasn't that different to Theresa May's really when you get into the details. Um, mm. Mm. And so that, you know, this was completely outrageous when it came to Theresa May, but now it's kind of uh, acceptable. I don't know. I, I find it kind of, mm. there is a sort of weird continuity over the last mm. kind of 20, 30 years, mm. despite mm. that. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's quite interesting because I mean, I, I'm like more you know, like the way I see like uh, society or history, I, I want to see it through like philosophical lens, you know, and like try to bring some kind of justice, fairness. Um, so if, you, if I, like in the way I see like British politics, if you look at the example of this Brexit, it's, it's done by a bunch of elites. And, and on that particular day, it just all the people went there and voted for it. Okay, but the whole show, before, after, during, are actually run by a bunch of elites. I mean, because the, the most of the people that, you know, mass, the populace, I mean, they're so busy for mm -hmm. their, you know, day-to-day -day things, like for their like livelihood. But people like Nigel Farage or like you know, this, this elites have lots of time, free time, because they've got, you know, things with them. And most of the Tories have got, you know, very, very privileged life. So you can see the why historically Tories are powerful and more like stable in terms of political party because they can invest so much time on, on the politics because they don't have to you know earn stuff for their family you know bring food for the children you know <laughs> all the <those. laughs> i mean I, 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 it's just like different take you know so you might find me a bit you no know, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Does it make sense? institutions, so institutions <laughs> tends to be how I think about things just because it's natural, but, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I also talk quite a lot about politics with people, so it's kind of not always kind of in those terms. Mm -hmm. like one thing that's interesting in that regard, uh, there were two stories. There's one I remember that uh, there was a, a, I think it was for Labour a long time ago, there was an expert in East German politics who was running for MP and like, uh, and something had come up or she'd mentioned it to someone is it okay so what does your lessons in east german politics tell you about moving the grip bin down the road you know <laughs> but also like i i was uh, for a long time involved a lot in politics like in elections and so on and uh i used to make a joke that we could solve local government by finding a way to turn dog poo into concrete so we could fill the potholes with them because those are the two most common things brought the door dog poo and potholes i imagine this year in dundee will be litter probably because the litter budget was cut and there's a lot of litter everywhere. But I think it's really important for people. It's very easy to sort of say, you know, yeah, grip bins and all these things, but day to day, these are the things that matter, right? If I think of the things I go home and complain about most of the time to my fiance, uh, it's not like, um, oh, our, we're not sending enough arms to Ukraine or something like that. It's the fact that my neighbor is using my bin <laughs> or urban it's more accurately but i'm the one who's furious about it <laughs> but these things matter day to day uh, and these are important political issues as well mm. so but i mean louis the, the the flip side of that argument is you know the the, the rich people the top rich the top five person they don't need to worry about these beams or you know potholes or anything because you know they, they live beyond those you know like day to day all those crisis management, the way the normal people like 90% live. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, who holds the power, who holds the resources, that 5%. So that's why, you know. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's an interest. I mean, this, I feel like a lot of the debates in the last 10 years go back to the kind of, 
whether you're motivated by money or whether you're motivated by culture sort of arguments. Mm. But, uh, you know, you talk, I still kind of am involved in that site, but like I keep it relatively quiet because it's not, I don't want it to come across as like overly partisan or anything. But at the end of the day, like it's good because you go, go out and meet people and talk about politics with them and see kind of what's happening. And, um, and you talk to people, things like seeing a GP, people can't go and see a doctor if you need it, right? Uh, I remember when I went to Italy because I was scared about this new health service. Uh, my attitude was, "Don't get sick." Uh, you know, I'll just not get sick and it'll be fine. Of course, I did get sick because mm. it turned out the Italian health service was great. Like, uh, um, mm. I got seen to, everything was fine. You know, there were no problems. It's just because there's an insurance element to it that I was a bit scared of. But, you know, it was fine. Mm. Um, but you know, going to see a GP at the moment is really difficult. Or schools, and this is all a result of underinvestment and so on. So. I do think that people are pretty hacked off at the, the state of affairs, and it does relate to bigger issues. Energy prices, I think, will filter down. I'm really worried about the imp impact that'll have on students, because students already are paid pretty much very little, and you know this is not something I expect the government in Scotland or in Westminster to um, to really address. They're not going to up the loans or give them any money in the short run to make to protect their living standards. So a lot of students are going to end up out of pocket. Mm. And so these large policies do affect people day to day. But I do think you're right insofar as like there's a lot of people who are very disconnected from that. And maybe it's because um, again, I like to blame safe seats because it's easy, but like if you don't need to go out and talk to people on the doors, you don't need to to, to do it. you don't need to do any of these things and a lot of MPs are talking about that they got lots of angry letters from the constituents over Boris Johnson so and that's making them the act and so angry letters are a way of kind of feeding into the system mm. I do think though that there is a, a kind of problem though in that the GPs have been a problem for ages underinvestment in public services have been has been a problem for ages and then um, and sometimes I don't know whether it's even the the sort of uh, lack of political will or whether it's some some sort of deeper factor such as like demographic changes you know we've got a lot of people at a stage in their life who are a big wave of population who are coming to the end of their careers they don't want to pay a lot of tax they benefit from council tax system uh, relative to other systems it would probably cost them more but then they're not they're the ones that would need a gp at that stage in life so you would expect There'd be a bit of uproar about that. Uh, you know, what was interesting, I watched one recently, it's a former Tory minister, I, I can't remember his name, he did a talk about these demographic changes and so on, and he was basically trying to warn the Conservative Party that they're building a large chunk of the electorate against them, because, you know, a lot of the policies are skewed towards this kind of aging part of the demographics who are getting towards retirement and who own houses and, and on all these things, but the high house prices paying for retirements and so on is having a huge knock-on impact to younger generations. Mm. And I, I look at, uh, you know, when you think just solely in terms of the economy and the material aspect of it, I do look at a lot of younger voters thinking, mm. you know, when I was a kid, Margaret Thatcher was a hypothetical because I was born in, what, 91. So I think it, she was gone, if not, I think on her way out at the time. But, you know, so... Yeah, I, Margaret Thatcher was something I heard about from my parents, kind of, oh, she did all these horrible things and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if anyone's watching, there you go, that's my background. But like, um, you know, now, Margaret Thatcher isn't the thing that everyone's railing against, right? It's the high house prices, the, you know, national insurance is being primarily levied on people who are working age. Uh, mm -hmm. The way that tuition fees are, fees are paid for lies on mm -hmm. younger people. They essentially have to pay a higher rate of tax if they go to university. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they're built in the long run. They're building weirdly a sort of strong anti-conservative force, and, and really, mm. it's like you're saying. There's a constituency that will eventually maybe change their minds if they lose mm. trust mm. in them, or maybe they, there's enough people come in to the other end. Uh, younger voters will begin to vote in larger numbers and eventually displace that. Mm. Uh, but again, this is all kind of hypothetical. <laughs> That's quite interesting introduction for our talk. <laughs> I mean, like going back to my original point, I mean, the way I see modern statecraft, it's just like a bunch of managers are now in charge. Mm. 
to run day to day things. No? So it's like just bureaucracy after bureaucracy. So, okay, no, so great. Then the Met Office, and then another one, another one, and then just drags and drags. And then, <laughs> so it's yeah. like, so these things are easy to manage rather, rather than, you know, solving problem with NHS, solving problem with, you know, the, those bigger issues. No one wants to touch them. No, <laughs> everyone is. I think, like, I'm a, if, if you're coming up from a left perspective, you might like this, is that, uh, there's a kind of view of how to objectively manage it, right? That there's a way of objectively managing things effectively, right? Uh, that there's uh, always a very clear thing to do in every scenario, which mm -hmm. we know that's, that's not the case. No. So the Mets, Mets looking into, the reason that's so redacted is because Sugri uh, writes this report and then the police are now doing an investigation, which means that the report now has to be redacted. Otherwise, the people who are interviewed might be influenced by what they write in the report and not tell you the truth, right? So mm. fine. And in terms of that, in terms of the written rules, that's totally fine. But we all know in terms of the political consequences of that, there's mm. lower trust in public inst institutions, that the, you know, the report has huge political significance and the timing of the report has huge significant political significance. Um, and uh, even kind of, you know, Sugri herself is kind of who you choose to do it. She's apparently mm. quite uh, fond of like really sticking to the rules and implementing them quite harshly compared to others. But who you pick, you know, these things are all political decisions as well. So the idea that there's a kind of objective political process to go through with all these things mm. um, kind of hides the fact that there's lots of political decisions being made here. Mm. And that sometimes it's not about what's written down as the rule, it's about what the idea behind the rule initially was what was the spirit of the rule that was implemented mm. and and to me the fact that the met have acted in the way that they have to delay a politically important report they can talk about the formal rules as they like but this is a big mess up because the police's role is not to influence the day-to-day -day running of the political system mm. nor to affect the levels of trust or make any decisions that could deal with the you know uh, trust or support or whatever for the government they, their, their job is to, you know, implement the law, but also uphold the law. So there's a kind of, I don't know, I think um, this idea, kind of new public management, I complain about it a lot, which was the, the idea from the 80s and 90s that kind of, you know, you could get managers from the private sectors to run. They have this phrase, doing more with less, to which I like to say, generally what happens though is they're doing less with less. So it'd be lovely if we could do more with less, but quite often, if you cut resources, mm. you end up doing less. And there's an assumption that everyone's very lazy in the public sector. We just let, like things tick by. It's not the case at all. It's a, um, so there's a, to me, new public management seems to be the sort of standard de facto, even like left-wing government seem to take mm. a lot of what's said and just implement it. That there's mm. objective measures of all these things. Mm. Mm. I, I don't buy it personally. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, if, if you look at, I think someone wrote a book called Bullshit Jobs. Yeah. What about this book? Yeah, I've read about it. I've not read the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the actual book, though. And what's his name? Um, David Graver, isn't he? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, what, <laughs> I mean, if you look at UK's, you know, this political, all those you know, things happening right now, I mean, even if you look at the prime minister jobs, I, I think this is one of those like bullshit jobs. I mean, so if if the country is running without a prime minister, what could have happened? Yeah, I mean, the problem is you'd have to talk about what it means by a bullshit job, right? I, I don't know what, what the, the book says is a bullshit job. I think the it's more that like... There, you know, there, there are like jobs like, I mean, we just don't need it. So like, to have that kind of job, then we have to hire another 12 people just to protect that job because he will make so much mistakes and he will, or she will show so much incompetencies. Mm -hmm. So, so do you know, like all those like project manager, you know, and then, you know, um, like diversity champion, you know, all those bullshit. Yeah. Well, here's one, here's one that's actually a kind of counter perspective, just uh, and it's not exactly the same, but I was reading through Exit Loyalty and Voice, if you know, it's Hirschman's famous one. Uh, it's used a lot in EU studies with Brexit and so on just now, but it's also just a good book. It's a really interesting because it kind of 
doesn't really fit into any category of whatever uh, social sciences and it can apply to politics. But, uh, but anyway, the, um, at the start, he's talking about the importance of redundancy in that like you should have, like normally in an organization, you should have kind of some sort of redundancy and almost as if it's a fact. And it's funny because again, back to new public management, you know, redundancy is seen as inefficient because you could be doing more with that money you're paying for these people to do this. We could be doing something that, you know, we could be spending it on stuff or cutting taxes, but then coronavirus hits and we've got no redundancy, which means the NHS today was reported that doctors are feeling bad about taking time off that they're legally obliged to take. Uh, that, um, you know, the, even the vaccinating of staff, they can't enforce that rule because they've got so few nurses and doctors there because there's been, you know, re reduced redundancy that if they lost all these unvaccinated staff, they wouldn't be able to run the NHS. So actually redundancy is quite a good thing. Um, and so, but, but I think there's a difference between the jobs that they're talking about, which are actually like cold face jobs, kind of allowing you to, to, to things to take over and the kind of managerial class jobs. Like mm. I remember one time on LinkedIn, the only job offer I ever got was a consultant job, which I, which I kind of made fun of because they go, would you like to be a consultant? I thought, what do you want to consult on? I consult on everything I'm an expert on because I consult, journals <laughs> by sending in articles consult with students i tell them how to write their essays you're just telling me to consult people on stuff i don't know <laughs> like i don't know maybe maybe i i i'm like uh not playing the game but <laughs> i mean you can see like this the prime minister jobs the prime minister the head of the state you know but what does this job entails i mean <laughs> the prime minister is not meant to do very much I, I got this book here. I was talking to Diane about it recently. <laughs> this book is Han Feizi, uh, but uh, my, my fiance calls him Han, Han Feizi or something because mm. she's Cantonese speaking. So uh, he's sort of translating it this way isn't always the best. Um, but it's interesting because this is like, um, this is like, I would say Machiavelli in, in sort of ancient China, right? Um, uh, it was written way before, uh, was it was 1500 BC or something like that. Oh my god. Um, yeah, this has got uh anyway. I was talking about it because it's quite interesting that this is all about a kind of different approach to government where the person in charge shouldn't be an expert in everything and shouldn't be doing anything, but they should delegate things. And the role of the of the you know king back then uh, was to delegate effectively. And how do we delegate to people to do jobs? Um and uh I, I don't know, it's it's very modern, and that's really to me what the prime minister ultimately should do. And to be honest, the Prime Minister can't do much. If you ever work in, um, if people have ever worked in Holyrood or Westminster or something, because I worked in Holyrood once um, upon a time, you realise that they've got, they've got shops to open and speeches to make. And you can't delegate that because you've got to do it, right? Yeah. So all the things like research, speech writing, constituency, engaging with letter to constituents, all this stuff you have to delegate to people. And then no, you, know, I, as, I mean, you can't do the things that you were kind of really passionate about doing when you're elected because you have to uh, go on the news and stuff. And it's PR most of the time. But I mean, what you are saying that, you know, this like delegation and all those PR thing, this is just bureaucracy, isn't it? <laughs> Kind of, yeah. Um, so, so you are basically employing people, you know, can you do my job and then you know, prepare for me and then I can do the speech. So, I mean, what's there? I mean, what kind of creativity is there? None. What's amazing though, I think what turns on his head is you, when you say that, it's like he appoints people to jobs, they do badly, then they lose their job. And where's the blame for Boris Johnson for picking? So, you know, if Priti Patel has a scandal in the Home Office, who appointed Priti Patel? You know, why is she in that job? She's in that job because mm -hmm. Boris Johnson picked. That, that, yeah. You know, that's yeah. that's his job. Or Gavin Williamson, or uh, I don't know if there are any ministers that. But if he has to reshuffle every once in a while, if there's constant reshuffles because there's mm -hmm. problems in the government. Well, who's to blame for that? That's his big responsibility, right? Is making sure that the right people are in the right place. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be first among equals, uh, but you get to choose who the equals are. So I don't know if that makes you <laughs> equal. I mean, I, I quite like this capitalism pyramid, and you can see on the top is just like money, and then the queen, queen, kings, prince, princes, and then you know, a bunch of all those religious leaders, uh, and then you know, some kind of army, police force, and all those things, and then the middle class aristocrats, and you know, everything is like you know. Is it is is the, on the shoulder of the poor working class 
everyone has got a slogan what they do. So like, for example, like the king says that will rule you. And the second is that all those religious leaders. So their role is to fool you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the police force is to punish you. <laughs> so, and then, and then the aristocrats says, yeah, we'll drink for you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. no, you're talking to Job's point, like the you know, a, again, I, new public management is one of my, the things I like to complain about uh, because I feel like over time it's now just become accepted. Like I, I do feel at present that, particularly here in Scotland, uh, the sort of principles of it are pretty much implemented, but nobody likes it, and it's kind of nobody's willing to do anything about it. But it's just this idea that you can get a manager from the public sector. Uh, no, the private sector in to go and manage something, and they immediately know how to do it better because they're from the private sector and it's more competitive. Whereas the public sector managers, oh, they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, like it seems to be, um, again in Scotland, kind of because it's just kind of what you engage with more because you live here, right? That there seems to be a kind of general centralization of, of just things, and it's. Um, the people in the center are taking more and more responsibility, but things are getting managed worse. This is the people with responsibility, then panic and centralize more things. Oh, it must be those at the bottom who are doing it wrong. So, you know, let's, let's, let's fix it with this new policy. We'll spend loads of money on this, this specific project that we've determined. Mm. Um, and I was talking to a counselor about this. I said, like, how much power do you actually have in the council? He said, well, not a huge amount because of every 10 pounds that they have to spend, most of it's already assigned by the government and they've only really got a little bit at the end to, you know, most of the money here in Scotland, the local government comes from central government spending plans. And they were talking about Fife and they were saying, you know, there's two schools. One of them was underneath the cutoff line to get this extra support for teachers. This other school is above it. Now, yeah, the schools in the better area, that has got kind of, you know, a lot more kind of affluent families going to it. There's also a lot of family going there who are not from affluent areas who are getting none of that support. And the council has that knowledge that the central government doesn't have. Or it's even in, even in a business, if you hire consultants in to tell things. I mean, the consultant, if I was a consultant, the first thing I'd be doing is asking staff, like, what are the problems you face day to day? What are the inefficiencies you have day to day? And they'll tell you, oh, the till, the register system's rubbish and it makes my job harder. Or I don't know why we're doing it this way. You know, the answers are all there. You don't need someone from outside or someone sitting in another part of the country to tell you how to do it. The answers are all there. And actually, I'm pretty relaxed about the fact that I'm, yeah, obviously there's the problem that people might do what they want, right? But um, if you if you don't do anything, so I'm not saying that just like government should do nothing and let the public sector just run itself entirely, because obviously mm -hmm. that's, that's complete too far. But it's that if you think, where does innovation come from? Innovation comes from people who work the job day in, day out, and they think, what would make this more effective? And so they go, okay, how about we do it like this? And then, so this is kind of allowing innovation to happen. If you just tell everyone, no, you're not doing it right. My dad worked in, like, in a tin factory and, was, and he worked out a way to like, uh, you know, tin things more effectively. I'm not going to use my jobs because I don't want former employers to watch this and think I'm complaining about them because they're not very bad. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, plus I might need a job in the summer, who knows? So uh, anyway, uh, he was told off for doing it that way. He says, no, you've got to do it this way. Why? So, uh, because that's how it's done. I'm the boss, you do it that way. So he goes, whatever. Because he's the same as me. He's like, I'm not going to argue about this. But it's the point that innovations can happen from the people who actually work the jobs. But the ideology is that you need someone who's paid X thousand pounds from outside to come and do it for you because they're from the private sector. They must know it better. Mm -hmm. Why not? You just listen to the people who are working on these issues day to day uh, who have the information, as they would say, about what it is that the problems they're dealing with. And then allow them to communicate with each other and share ideas rather than have someone in the center who they have to report to and write a paper to. Mm. It's all formalized and then it's reviewed by reviewer one and two. And by the time anything's changed, mm. it's 10 years after and there's new problems. Mm. Mm. I mean, the way I see it, you know, this like we talk about this creativity and all this innovation, which can actually, you know, change the society forever. Paradigm shift we are talking about. Um, so perhaps, like, I mean, the people who are in power, they don't want all those innovations and creativity because that can change the, st the status quo of the whole system. That's I suppose if you're thinking about government, right, you're thinking about a minister in the centre, and someone uh, kind of lower down has an idea and starts implementing it, right? Um, there's, 
high potential costs for you because you're worried that well what might be the consequences of this change right because change naturally brings uncertainty and so what if i get the blame for it so there's kind of in the way we run things and the way that people who are higher up might think uh, kind of big risks to letting people make decisions but there's big risks to not letting people make decisions which is that everything kind of slowly deteriorates as it has yeah. in the last decade or so um, you know, people, as again, people can't see a GP and they can see it and all the solutions that are there, uh, everyone's mm -hmm. scared to implement because you might annoy mm -hmm. someone. And mm -hmm. I do think in general, like political will, there is no political will to really try anything that out of the box, really. The, all the answers we have are like Brexit or changing the constitution or things, but the actual constitutional changes that might actually allow people to have ideas or limit the power of those in authorities are kind of... Uh, not really i don't know it's too risky for those in charge to change it so there's mm. an incentive for those in charge to kind of just keep things as they are because they might mm. someone lower down might make a mistake and it's it's weird insofar as there's a, a, a dual logic in that those in power are the ones who talk to you you know when they want you to help out with things I, when i used to work i've worked in a few places again i remain nameless Sometimes they come out with things like we're a team, we're a family, as a business, we're a family, right? And we, we work as a team towards these goals, right? Okay, okay, we're a team, right? And then when it comes to your contract, uh, <laughs> you know, you're saying away all sorts of rights and it's like, oh, no, you don't get paid for that. You only get paid for that. Or, you know, we only, we only employ you between this and this, but you have to come in half an hour earlier. Uh, because, because, you know, I demand. So uh, what happened to the teamwork? And so my attitude was kind of, you can, you can be transactional or you can be this kind of like, you know, uh, 1800s kind of, I'll buy you a house and all that. What's the, the sort of round trees and Cadbury's and all that sort of approach to the business where you'd be providing dentistry and all that. You can do one or the other. If you're going to be transactional, don't expect me to not be transactional in return. It's like you can be transactional or you can not be transactional. Mm. But there's a kind of, like, if you're an employee, you're expected to be part of a team. But you're not part of a team if you're at the top. You're you're beholden to the shareholders who want to, you know, do yeah. less with less. More of us, sorry. But but <laughs> those people who are on the top, they will also, you know, promote this idea about, you know, we are family. Uh, so like if you see examples like I think Walmart, I mean, then you know, all those people who are sitting on the top, the, this particular family, um, they always talk about this kind of family, you know, this like ethos and you know, um, so we are his, his team, you know we are thriving but at the same time like when you say like those like 16 members of that particular family everyone's net worth is like at least two billion dollar versus you know this like 10 pound ten dollar an hour <laughs> this mm. like people they're asking them you know we are family it doesn't make any sense you know it's just, I, I, yeah you see these articles from time to time from a business where the owner was talking to their staff and, and discovered that they had problems because they weren't being paid enough so they took a pay cut and paid their staff more and turned out that their staff were happy. Who would have thought that having more money might contribute to a higher standard of living, which might help resolve certain social problems? Like, did you ever, there was one called The Secret Millionaire. It was on TV a while back. Yeah. Every week it was the same. They go into their shop, uh, they see their employees and their employees have to care for their mother or their grandmother because they can't afford healthcare. And then they get, they, they get put more pay in than the, the billionaire. And it's like, yeah, but you don't need you don't need a TV program to make you aware of that. It's, it's obvious that people who are in your employed by you, who are not being who are being paid minimum wage with crap hours, are not going to be very happy. And if you make them happy, they might work a bit harder and be more loyal to the brand. But it's almost like you can't just ask someone to be loyal to you. You've got mm -hmm. to earn loyalty. Um, because I think those programs are much more dangerous. I mean, for me, this is just like propaganda for you know this like business model. And then this one guy, you know, owner shows some like generosity. And then, you know, yeah, one guy is very happy crying, you know, it's a great guy. <laughs> and and it's, it, which is linked to, you know, some people say that if you ask all those millionaires in the world, they're all self-made. They work really, really hard, you know. So if you talk about that might be like, you know, five million millionaires in the world. But if you're talking about, you know, they're like seven billion people. <laughs> yeah. But the, no, the, the, the top two person, they are more or less, you know, it's just family asset. You know? mm -hmm. So like there's, there's a like, I think there's a punch cartoon. I mean, the famous cartoon is, so like this very middle-aged guy, you know, relaxed guy, but very rich. 
and they've gotten a good background of the families. And one guy was uh, saying to the other guy, he said, you know, my dad gave me this like famous advice, you know, I stick to it, you know, forever of my life. That, so he was saying that, son, here is $2 million for you, you know, try to save it. <laughs> That's the biggest advice he's got. <laughs> yeah. So like Trump's dad, you know, like, yeah, here is like $2 billion, you know. Small one of a billion dollars. I remember it well. A small one of a billion dollars. <laughs> so, I tried to get a tenner off my dad sometimes. It's like, what do you need it for? <laughs> so, I mean, you need advice, like, if you get, like, two million. In the long run, I do think it's going to backfire on them because I think you can only go so I, I may be optimistic in this regard. It's the most, like, pessimistic optimism you can get. But things will get so bad that something has to give yeah. because people have to go elsewhere. But particularly with property, because I think property is the big issue, that um, like anyone who wants to get on the property ladder just now has to, has to have rich parents. That's how you buy a house now. But it used to be that you could get a mortgage, but now you just have rich parents to buy your house. That's how it has to go. Uh, it, well, that's how it's going, and it can't go like that forever. Um, and there's a number of different solutions to this. And one is to try and like reform the kind of incentives in the housing market and so on, which might bring down property prices. And the people who own houses just now, who mm -hmm. vote for the government generally, mm -hmm. uh, who have something to lose and vote, vote on those issues because they've got so much money to potentially lose, which by the way, this is hypothetical money. This is an asset that they bought yeah. for X amount. It's now worth that. But if it goes down, you still made all this money. You still have all this for No, but this extra money that's hypothetically mine. Anyway, um, it's not going to change until either that demographic, you know, begins to retire. But they could always pass their homes on. I have no idea what's going to happen in that regard. Um, or you can tax, you know, uh, taxing land is a big thing that I, I believe in. Um, but that's not going to happen as well because nobody's going to vote for that out of that cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, or you could just do what's probably going to happen, which is the government sits on this for as long as it needs to before it starts losing elections and becomes a liability and they make some minor changes. Or there's a big housing crisis, people get very angry, and the problem just kind of rolls on until someone's prepared to do something about it, which is probably what's going to happen. But at some point, something's going to have to give. There's no way you can run a society where a basic need like housing is essentially, you get it if you're from a rich background, and you don't get it if you're from a poor background. I think the same is going to happen with healthcare as well. Mm. We're undergoing privatization, but not like in the 80s where they would sell it off. But it's a kind of privatization by neglect, which is that anyone who can afford to see a doctor privately will, will pay the... Uh, actually, my fiancé went to the pharmacy we live near and went in and they said, well, you can see a GP just now. It's £11 a month. It's basically a Netflix subscription <laughs> price, mm. you know. Um, and, and you think a lot of people would go for that, right? £11 a month. I think a lot of people would go to the pharmacy here, but this private sector GP they can see and they'll pay the money. But of course, that's going to create another society where people who can who can afford it will get better healthcare than those who can't. And so, mm. I can't see it going on like this forever. It presently, it feels like those in charge are quite happy to um, make sufficient changes to remain in power, but nothing more than is really necessary, mm. right? So when it comes to housing, oh, we've, we'll build some houses to kind of placate those mm. who are upset about it. We're not going to fix it because that would lose its uh, votes. I do think it's going to have to change because. They're going to lose their jobs eventually. But what's depressing is, yeah, yeah. It, it's a secret report. They'll lose their job because they had parties in lockdown, not because they mismanaged the economy to such an extent that there's loads of people who can't who are in rubbish living conditions, and that there's students who might be put into fuel poverty in a few months and not be able to run their electricity all day, or rents are sky high and eating out, e eating up people's incomes, or mm -hmm. you know people kind of. All these things, they're not being voted out because of that, it's because of hypocrisy. A hypocrite can be, can still be correct, you know? Like, mm. you, you can be a hypocrite and say things that are correct. You might be a hypocrite to run the country well, but the problem is they're not running the country well, in my opinion. They're running the country pretty badly. So um, you, you've got two problems, you've got people. <laughs> but it's just the hypocrisy to me is not the big issue. <laughs> it's, it's like, no. <laughs> if you're a bank robber, I don't think anyone's going to go, but you know the worst thing about that bank robber? They were a hypocrite. Like, come on, <laughs> the bank robbing's the big thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like, what's the, what's the difference between the bank robber and the guy who is, you know, avoiding tax? I mean, 
Yeah, yeah. Not much difference, isn't it? So if you talk about you know the world's history, who is doing the biggest damage to the you know society or you know well-being or humanity? So if you look at the you know this like I always mention this particular statistics like there is like thirty-two trillion dollar sitting in the tax haven. Mm-hmm. You see, so like thirty-two trillion, what that money could do to the society, to the world? It's not like that money is like hiding somewhere. It's in the bank banking system. And someone is protecting it, some kind of law, some kind of statecraft, whatever it is, bureaucracy. And so, like, who's doing the biggest damage to the society, to, to everything? That was a good thing. I did the lecture in Law and Order last semester and talking about kind of the social construction of what we consider mm. a law and order problem, um, or just as I said, a problem in, in general that we have to deal with through government and kind of, you know. A lot of the things that worry people the most are not the crimes that are committed most often, and that you know a lot of the, the crimes that are more common are not ones that hit the, mm. the headlines. But people are quite rightly worried about being murdered, which is totally fine, and, mm. or anything else, right? Perfectly legitimate worries, but that there are other crimes that are hugely costly that are not uh, on mm. the agenda. So when we consider what we consider as a law and order problem, it's kind of and it to an element socially constructed what it is we're actually measuring or what we're focusing on mm. and that that is part of the debate but also you know this is kind of back to the kind of objectivity idea that if, if mm. we want to say objectively we brought crime down well what is crime mm. what mm. crimes are we measuring what's the mm. What, mm. how are we quantifying what crimes are important or not yeah. are all crimes even in importance or are mm. some less even than other i think like, um, like like for example like you know this like way Boris Johnson has been behaving or like, you know, any other, you know, crime related thing with the very top one person, it looks like they're much more relaxed, isn't it, with the crime. It seems like Boris Johnson, it was documented, you know, things happen. Like, so mm-hmm. if you had done the same thing, you know, you would be worried or you already paid the fine and it all kind of things happen to you. Look, like. You saw the resignation in the House of Lords video of the person who resigned because COVID loans were being given and there wasn't enough being done to make sure they were given uh, appropriately. Now, I was on universal credit during the pandemic because contract came to an end, the job markets mm. evaporated. So what are you going to do? Uh, I didn't get furloughed, so I had to go, mm. go on universal credit. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the person from universal credit who phoned me was actually quite nice, but I have no idea if they were representative mm. of everyone. Mm. Uh, but to be honest, it was it was kind of like, what are you doing to find a job? So well, I'm trying to write articles and apply, I'm applying to you know, these mm. positions. But I had to fill out every week, here's what I've done to try and find a job on this website. So I had to constantly fill out, kind of, I've written this, I've applied to these places, I've done all these things. Um, and uh, apparently there's more pressure for people in universal credit to just take a job even outside their own area and uh, just mm-hmm. find a job. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of kind of, again, these phone calls you get. It's not even as bad as it was. It's worse now because it was during the pandemic. I was lucky I managed to find a job um, last summer and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when I went back into employment. But also kind of there's times when you're in a, when you're in a job and then like, you have no income that month because of hourly contracts. They phone you up. They say, I thought you had a job. I, like, I do, but they don't pay me every month. And so there's, but the fact is, right, there's, to, for me to get, to get the 400, 500 pound a month, lots and lots of bureaucracy. Yeah, this year, we've got someone resigning because millions of pounds were given out in COVID loans, which might have been fraudulent. Um, and where's where's the headlines about that? Where's the task force to deal with this in the way that where's the bureaucracy where people who had COVID loans have to sign every week? Here's how I use them. You know, it's, it's a it is a double standard. And it's... Because I mean, I know that during this COVID, I mean, Boris Johnson and his family went for this holiday in Spain and living in like at one of the Goldsmiths, you know, family members, this like special some kind of hospitality building. In a normal day for other people, it cost them 25,000 euro for a week. Boris Johnson didn't pay anything because this is his friend. Yeah. So this is, that's like friend on like benefit, isn't it? Because, so it's not like, you know, this Goldsmith family offered me to stay in that, you know, chalet for, for a yeah, year. But- 
what what was reciprocal for that? This is a, that's a potential yeah. lobbying issue as well, right? Yeah. I'm not yeah. the prime minister, so the government gives me four hundred pound a month and tells me to go and find a job. I'm not in any responsibility. If you're the prime minister and people are giving you free holidays, there's potential ethical problems with that. Mm. There are quite but obvious, I mean, right? But at the same time, when you talk about you know just a friend, but also he actually cost him twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, you know, staying there. So he actually stole twenty five thousand dollars from him. <laughs> Well, or or it's supposed to be reciprocated in some way. It yeah, just so like gives you know, twenty five thousand dollars and expects like all, in return. All these all these equations are actually bad faith things, isn't it? Yeah, there's no honesty there. You know, like what you are doing, and and the other guy also knows what what they are doing. Yeah, there's an obvious ethical problem there, and but there, it's not the only one from Boris Johnson. People, I mean, the, it was that was the main point about people who paid to redo his flat, right? What are they getting in return for paying to redo their flat? And it's not an obvious form of lobbying insofar as there's a very clear paper trail, but that's kind of the problem. Mm. Um, if I if I pay the prime minister, if I send the prime minister money, uh, I go into a register. People will be wondering why did I send the money? I wouldn't send the money, but uh, but it it looks like for some people to get that four hundred pound a month, you have to fill up you know at least twenty forms. Boris Johnson did not fill any form to get the 25,000 worth of holiday. Yeah. And also, if I filled it out wrong, I would get people chasing me up. And, yeah. So and like all I mean, these things. <laughs> you see the difference, how things are very easy for some people and how things are really difficult for other people. Yeah. It's, it's you know, one of, the, one of the kind of horrible things is that it's more expensive to be poor than it is to be rich. And so, you know, when I was on universal credit, um, I was sort of thinking, okay, you need a credit rating. If I'm going to eventually buy a house, I'll need to have a decent credit rating. So, Because you hit an age where these things start to matter and you realize I've not thought about things like a pension or any of these things in years. So I, you know, I've got to start thinking about it. So everyone says, get a credit card. Well, I can't get a credit card if you're on universal credit. You can earn enough. Also, like, well, you know, you're only, you know, they're not going to give you one just uh, that fact. So I have no access to credit. I have no access to all these things, which makes other things more expensive for me. Whereas if you're wealthy, you've got easy access to credit, you know, your insurance costs might be lower for whatever reason, you know, at least as they say, money goes to money, right? But um, it's, it's cheaper to be rich than it is to be poor. Mm. And it's, uh, and it's, I mean, uh, it's, it's like that, that cartoon, bunch of cartoon, you know, dad just you know, gave me this famous advice that, you know, here is $2 million for your son. That's two million is actually you know coming with all those packages. You know, mm -hmm. bank will treat you better. You know, society will treat you better. You know, friends will treat you better. All kind of things, all kind of you know, extra thing you'll get, extra package, extra you know, everything. Well, it's the same in academia, I think, increasingly. So when mm -hmm. I did my PhD, you got four years of funding in the UI, which was great, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to complain at all about that. I was very lucky to get four years rather than the normal three. Uh, but at the end of the four years, you got no money. So you move back in with your parents, you have to kind of work there, you have no access to the, you know, to journals even. Well, actually, it did technically it's online, but you know, you don't have access to the library, it's kind of not as good. Uh, whereas a lot of people who 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 you can't blame them personally, right? This is the system. They were able to access a lot more resources, go to conferences and so on that I couldn't, uh, by virtue of you know, mm. having enough money to do it. Mm. Money, money matters in terms of being an early career scholar. But also when you finish your PhD, you, you're in the situation where a lot of the jobs are kind of low paying and so on. But there's certain people who, I was chatting with someone, I, I won't name them because it's their story, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but like they were saying that they were told by someone, why don't you just take a year off and focus on writing? It's like, yeah, well, how am I going to pay the bills? So there's postdoc funding and so on, but I feel like a lot of postdoc funding is kind of, is if you've got enough money to kind of help you. Obviously, I'm not saying that if you're from a poor background, you can't do it, of course. I'm just saying that, as I said, it's, if you have the resources there to take a year off and do publications for a year mm -hmm. and pay your way to university or whatever, it's quite convenient. But if, mm -hmm. if you don't, it's going to be a lot more difficult. And in the long run, I think that's going to be an issue that... Mm. Uh, I think in the long run, academia is going to be, there's going to be a, a, a long run and an equality problem because obviously issues of material wealth and so on are not just to do with income. Mm. You know, 
background and so on affects your likelihood of having access to these resources as well. So all these kind words we have about like improving mm. representation and so on, it, if the money's not there to help people who really need it, like, cause I'm not from a particularly poor background compared to others, mm. but mm. even this is kind of, if I wasn't living with my fiance this year, I wouldn't be able to come and live here, you know, um, why should my fiance be taking the burden for, you know, for me trying to establish myself and get time to do publications. And I don't know, I just think that um, it's these cuts over the last, as I said, 10, I don't know how long, but it feels like the last 10, 12 years in particular, since mm. the restructurings of uh, the fundings and fees and so on. Um, a lot of the incentives they brought in is to try and do more with less, which has just resulted in less. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, one thing I mentioned one time, we were talking about widening access, I, well, I remember reading about this thing to try and get more people from ethnic minorities into reading the classics, right? Because they said the problem with the classics is that there's two white and two upper middle class and upper class, right? The classics was dominated by them. So they would try and encourage people from different backgrounds to study the classics to try and make it more diverse. Okay, well, let's look at what you're doing with all these other subjects that the government wants to make more expensive, right? Because it's STEM that should be cheaper but the government wants to make the fees for like political science and all these things more expensive. What's going to be the consequence of that if it's more expensive to study these subjects? It's probably going to, you know, disincentivize those who can't afford to study them, to study them. And so you're going to come back in 20 years with this new fund to try and widen access. You can say as much as you want about widening access, but the money has to be where, where, you, where the, the speak is. If you really want, if you're really serious about addressing inequality, you have to put your money where your mouth is not just say it's like employers not just say we're a family or oh, we work together or a community no, earn the trust show that you care about these things mm. um, there's too little of that i mean i think one of the like karl marx said you know this like riddle of the history if you can solve the riddle of the history which is basically hunger you know this shelter or you know basic things i mean then you know that 80 percent problem solved and then from there you can see like I think one of the things, because I'm not particularly, ide well, I, I was, anyone who says they're not particularly ideological tends to be ideological, they're just trying to hide it, but like, you know, I, I don't, I, I, basically, without thinking of it, kind of just thinking in terms of experiences, because I, I really think, to be honest, that's, in these sorts of debates, just experience is sometimes useful, like individual experiences of it. Mm. Um, I think... I was talking about this with a lot of people and, and they were talking about how, yeah, but these jobs don't get you, these, these degrees aren't getting you a job at the end of the day. I said, yeah, but isn't it, isn't it, uh, isn't it unfair that for many people throughout history, university is a chance to learn about something they really find important to them as an individual. So, you know, this will continue to be the case, as you're saying, for those who are well, better off, that you can go and study classics, you can go and study what you're passionate about, learn about it, as a human being to grow as a human being and that's an opportunity you get mm. but if you can't afford that it's purely utilitarian you learn you earn your degree so you work better in the workplace and that's a i don't know i think to me that that's a really amazing thing about universities is that you can go and have a passion in like in politics for example or somewhere you have a passion for something and spend four years of your life engaging with it and learning about it and, and grow as a human being and grow with that but that's a great right, and it's the kind of, um, you know, you could say that it's the kind of trying to make it something marketized, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a training for the private sector, mm -hmm. but actually having people who have engaged with things and, and, and who have grown as individuals is, is great, to be honest. I think universities have a lot to offer in that regard. So why should that freedom be there for some and not others? Mm -hmm. um, here's the thing, actually, one of the, one of my criticisms of um, a lot of analysis of this is that you know, it's often accused of being neoliberal, and I actually think it's a little bit different to that, because if you look at what a lot of neoliberal think tanks say about universities, they don't support the status quo, they want more marketization, they want more, uh, more of these sorts of factors. I was thinking about this in terms of when the government announced this idea that you would pay more fees for certain subjects than others. That's the government incentivizing people to study things more than others. Now, neoliberalism is built on the idea that consumer gets to choose what they do, right, at market rates. So the government's setting the market rates and saying, we want you all to study this because we believe that these are right. But we also think that these subjects are telling you to be a Marxist and therefore you shouldn't study that. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, you'll study famous Marxists like John Rawls, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But like, um, I, I, that to me isn't neoliberalism. I think that's, I, I don't know, I don't think the people in government are as ideologically consistent as implied by this. I think it's a lot more confused and a lot more difficult and there's a lot of other values there at play mm. a lot of maybe kind of social factors involved mm. in in terms of viewing yeah. like I mean, I, mean, I mean if you see like you no know, this modern statecraft all those institutions like for example like nhs or like or like universities i mean universities are supposed to do education isn't it mm. but it seems like education is not in the discussion much it's all about you know recruitment whether you get enough students international students whether you brought enough money from you know those things it's like something else is happening isn't it yeah to me uh, other the, things are more important than actually what you are supposed to do is actually important yeah well uh, that's one of the issues um I, I do think it's related to a lot of these trends throughout the 80s and 90s on measuring and objectivity and kind of measuring satisfaction how do we measure it I mean, you can go and talk to the students and tell, ask them how it was and engage with them. But also, is that an accurate way of measuring quality education? No, because student evaluations have been proven to be sexist, that men perform better than women in student evaluations. So if you're going to measure quality on that basis, then you, in, you structure it so that men will do better than women, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of fact, factors and problems in that regard. But mm -hmm. what, what's been set up like in Scotland is slightly different to Westminster. Mm -hmm. To me, it's not intellectually consistent. There's no consistent ideology there. It's just kind of evolved into this way. Mm -hmm. And it's a mess because a Scottish student pays X amount a year um, in fees from the government. And an English student pays Y a line and a foreign student pays Z a line. And this hasn't been set up for any specific reason. It's been set up because they can get, you know, it will do. And until it really falls apart, it won't get fixed. I, I got the feeling with that during COVID that the government only really would step in with these things and, you know, the social distancing and so on when it would get to that point. But there's been a comment. It's, it's not that there's an intellectually consistent like, ideology being uploaded. It's that they can get away with what's there and they're not really worried about the consequences. And I feel like ideology and these factors come in and but how willing you are to fix these problems and address them, right? But you're, if you're kind of like, ah, well, we can get away with it. The consequences of you know, um, different classes having different accesses to education is tolerable. That's an ideological mm. decision not to fix it, rather than, you know, people coming in and trying to do things. Because I, I don't, I don't view people in charge as competent enough to come in with a really clear action plan and implement it wholly. Because generally, people don't implement their plans wholly anyway. Um, I, mean, I don't know what position that puts me in in terms mm. of debates, but. Um, mm. Again, no, I try not to think too much about <laughs> what I'm categorized as, just focusing on what, what, what seems to be real. So, I mean, the, my, my problem is like whenever you know these things, these institutions like come come to me, I try to you know unpack it. Like, I mean, what does it mean? Like, you know, what what university does, you know, or should or ought, you know, all kind of questions there. Mm -hmm. And then if you try to unpack, and then what's happening in the universities in the Western world right now? This has nothing to do with education. If you ask any, any, you know, people like me or any of my colleagues, I mean, what we are doing now, this is, this is not education. For us, this is like survival, uh, for the students get something out of this. And then, and then someone is getting lots of money as well, you know, like. Yeah, so when my dad was a head teacher, you'd complain about league tables all the time, because you would say, guess who's at the top of the league tables? So those who get to pick for students, right? And those in better off areas with, with more resources where you need less help from the state. Oh, surprisingly, they do better in league tables. Yeah. And all the it, other schools it, it, vary it always, from year to year. Like in the top 10 universities in the world, it's always Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford. And all. Why North. do you think that's the case? Oh, oh, they got lots of students with lots of money going there. Yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> but this is the problem of measurement. There's a view that you can objectively measure these things and, and uh, you, you can measure some aspects of it, but you've got to be critical of what you're measuring and try and come to a conclusion that's, that's uh, a bit more um, balanced. Um, it's but like I, student I, evaluations, you've got to be critical of the fact that there's certain biases that might be put mm. into that. So you can't just say, mm. okay, students like this course. How do you, how do you know that's true? And it's, it's weird that for a society where, uh, you know, 
you're talking about measurement all the time. When it comes to methods, people seem to be quite uncritical of the stuff mm -hmm. they're getting through. Mm -hmm. But also, like most of the institutions are not democratically run or elected as well. So there's a serious problem with the like you know. So when we talk about we talk about election is a one kind of benchmark for democracy. But if you see the rest of the landscape, hardly there is any kind of democratic you know accountability anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like you know I, I think the biggest benchmark in the modern world, especially in the Western world, is just how much money you can make. I mean profit basically you know um, mm. so when university is driven by you know profit or this kind of market model that that will do serious damage for the things which you really want to achieve i think the part of the problem is why don't you have to i mean why you have to pay why a student has to pay fee so if you talk about the if you talk about the whole europe if you want to make higher education tertiary education like free how much money did it cost we're talking about it's not like there's no money there is money there isn't it the, the tax heaven has got 32 trillion yeah well it's also the again the kind of inconsistency is that and like you spend like 2.3 2.3 trillion dollar in like afghanistan and iraq without achieving anything it's it's the so the priority you know, one of the issues is that um you talk about student fees essentially being a higher tax rate, which it's not really because there's interest rates attached to it and the, the amount of tax you pay. So, but it is tied to income, right? In terms of how much you pay back. Well, if that's what it effectively is, why isn't it sold to the public like that? You know, that if you go to university, you, you will pay extra tax. It, it's again, it is inconsistent and it's, and it's just been allowed to kind of evolve as need be to try and keep things ticking over. But what gets me particularly is, the incentive for university, it, the question ultimately is who should pay for education? You know, where should the money for education come from? Uh, because where, where it's coming from just now is coming from fees from attracting students from abroad. There's an incentive to bring students from abroad who will pay substantially higher fees than domestic students. Is it who's so who's paying for higher education in this case? But obviously it comes from a lot of different factors, but one, one set of factors when it comes to fees is that domestic students are subsidized by students from from overseas. Now, is that a fair or logical way to plan out uh, ethically how we should fund higher education? Mm -hmm. Or when you look at rents, you know, universities are incentivized to, to take into these rents. And sometimes I wonder whether it's, mm -hmm. um, I do think those in charge have a responsibility to answer these, but I also think government has a responsibility to get serious and think about mm -hmm. what are the ethics of how, we're, how what the incentives we've put in place in terms of telling people how to act. And as I said, the ideology is not really in the structuring it that way. It's in the willingness to be able to go out and fix it and go out and say, actually, this is unethical. We should do something about this. Mm -hmm. But to me, a lot of people in charge are quite happy to let things take over so long as it doesn't lose an election. I just feel like just now people are quite happy to just let things take over in charge. And, and, that, and that's the thing that amazes me. I am amazed that people aren't more willing to go out and Mm. They say that people change, are more likely to change their votes than ever before, that voters are uh, op being open to change uh, their minds, you know, a trend that's been going on for a long time, but also people are incredibly tolerant. Mm. You know, this long-term trend of people being open-minded to change, switching their votes, swingers or whatever you want to call them, um, but yeah, this is a long-term trend, yeah, people also seem remarkably sticky when it comes to Mm. you know, students in uh, universities or people who can't see a GP, yeah, I'll still vote for Boris Johnson because he's, you know, owning the lips or whatever it is that is uh, fighting the culture war. It's, it's quite funny because, I mean, I mean, I think Boris Johnson went to Eton. So Eton is very expensive private, you know, school. Uh, but the, their argument is, yeah, Boris Johnson went to Eton because he got his scholarship, King's scholarship. So, like, I mean, why he got King's scholarship, why he was good in that, you know, in that competition, why not the other one, someone from Glasgow? Yeah, because he's well known for his intellectual because, cons because uh, some of the things are already set for him, isn't it? He has got serious advantage in that, in that competition. Uh, so it's not like the origin started or everyone started on the same, from the same position. He has got already, you know. <laughs> But where's the willingness to fix this? This is the issue. There's no willingness to address these issues. No. And it's the, that's the concern I have in general is that mm. we can talk for as long as we like on these. And, and it's very clear that 
as voters, we have some power over it as well. Mm -hmm. um, but people are really amazingly willing to stick with whoever it is, mm -hmm. no matter how bad things get. Mm. I mean, like one thing always worries me, you know, this rise of populism or nationalism, it means some, it's, 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 a, it's a sign that capitalism is struggling rather than, you know, that that's the problem. Nationalism is, is, is so the nationalism and all those populist ideas coming through, like there's a problem somewhere, which is capitalism. So if you look at the India, India's rise of, you know, this kind of far right groups and this nationalistic, you know, uh, very ultra ideological idea about their nationhood, but at the same time, if you look at America, so India has got like close to two billion people. Like I mean, almost seven hundred ninety-five million people have got no access to electricity. That's more or less default position for last you know fifty mm -hmm. years. That problem did not so get solved. That the poverty did not get solved. So it looks like then why people suddenly become, you know, very, very proud of their country. <laughs> yeah. So that's, it, that's, that's interesting. You know? So I can, I can see like, you know, like sometimes I feel that perhaps I'm, I'm wrong, but it kind of makes sense to me, like, you know, when capitalism in crisis, how to fix it, the fix, quick fix is that kind of things, you know, Brexit mm -hmm. or, you know, idea about <laughs> yeah there's Great. you know this is not a new debate if you read about the kind of labor party in the, the early 1900s there were also problems to do with nationalism back then so the founder of the labor party is much revered I, I used to like to point out to labor friends of mine that he was not very pleasant to my ancestors when they moved here from lithuania he, he said some pretty racist stuff about them about <laughs> that they they're all drunk and they smell of garlic and that they, they're illiterate and all these things it's like there was a there, there was a hundred years ago kind of mm. a lot of these kind of nationalistic things, but at the time it was a time of crisis as well and great inequality that mm. was only beginning to be addressed through the early welfare state, um, and mm. so you know seeing it in the long run, I do think there is a kind of um, relationship between inequality and um, mm. kind of insecurity and the need for this kind of nation or an identity to protect you and um, but again i mean what well, we haven't really talked about what i study which is the institutions no. of how the eu is governed but to be yeah. honest like, so I'm, uh, I'm like coming to that because I mean, yeah. this, these things will fit in into that kind of you know your particular area 